Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome to Conversations in the Digital Age. With us tonight is Vali Nasser. Vali Nasser is the Dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. He is also the author of a compelling new book, a best-selling book, entitled The Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy and Retreat. Vali, we are honored and delighted to have you with us. It's good being here with you. Now, the book, of course, is about America's declining influence in the Middle East. And uh, I think we could start with uh, the uh, Obama administration's uh, reference to a pivot, a pivot mm -hmm. toward uh, Asia in our foreign policy. And uh, where I come from, pivot means you kind of neglect one interest for another. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what the Obama administration is doing? Well, I think a, a very clear theme of the president's first term was that the United States wishes to reduce its footprint in the Middle East, not only withdraw militarily from Iraq and Afghanistan, but largely let uh, others, including regional actors, take the dominant role in the region, and for the United States to focus its energies on Asia. Uh, countries in the region, people in the region, very well understood the term pivot means not only pivoting towards Asia, but pivoting away from the Middle East. And they got the message very clearly from pronouncements from American officials visiting the region, from American media, from the discussion of the administration, that there's a certain amount of disinterest in the Middle East. And this even got reflected very much in the reaction of the administration to uh, the Arab uprising, particularly in its hopeful early period of uh, not getting engaged uh, politically, diplomatically, economically, and largely allow uh, events to take their own course uh, with, with an attitude that the United States does not really have a big stake in this region. Only where there is a major issue that arises, we may pay uh, attention to it. So I think the idea that Middle East doesn't matter as much as we thought it did, and what happens there does not really impact the United States, and we should actually really try to shrink our presence in the region uh, is, a very, is a late motif of uh, the Obama administration's foreign policy and is very well understood in the region as really the underlying reason for the anger and disappointment in the region towards the United States today. Can we really be seen to turn our backs on uh, 300 million people who live there? Well, the problem is that it's not a credible foreign policy largely because we made a big pronouncement about shifting to Asia, but in reality, we are stuck in the Middle East. Middle East captures the headlines. The Secretary of State spends the lion's share of his time on Arab-Israeli issue, on Syria, on Egypt, uh, on Iran. Even countries in Asia are looking at the way that we are handling the Middle East as a gauge of how seriously they should take our pivot to Asia and how much they should invest in an American strategy of uh, containing China and managing Asia. So, so in some ways, the rest of the world doesn't think that we either have left the Middle East or we can leave the Middle East, or it's actually prudent to do so. Uh, and, and that disjuncture between what we proclaim and what the rest of the world sees and thinks has created a credibility gap for American foreign policy. We seem to talk so much in, in terms of uh, cliches and jargon in the foreign policy field. Mm -hmm. We talk of red lines and mm -hmm. we talk of pivots. Uh, and of course, it's uh, the tyranny of analogy in many ways. But do you think pivot was an unfortunate uh, term that the administration is now pulling away from? Well, they tried to pull away from it almost immediately and, and use the terminology of rebalancing. But calling it something different did not really change what the administration meant. And that was a declaration, essentially, a foreign policy declaration to the Middle East and the world that we are going to reduce our interest in the Middle East. We are going to reduce our, our engagement, and we're going to focus on Asia. Now, you know, I think the world takes the United States' word seriously, uh, particularly when it's repeated and repeated and repeated, and it's seen in action. Well, not when we said there was a red line. They didn't take us so seriously because we didn't follow through with it in well, Syria. Well, the assertion of a red line was taken seriously, and not following through with it also was, was consequential because ultimately the credibility of your foreign policy is dependent on what you say, 
what you uh, declare as your intentions, what you declare as your goals, and then the willingness that you show following through with it. If you say there is a red line for the United States, you're making a big declaration about our foreign policy goals, our values, our intentions. When you don't follow through with it, it has consequences. Even all the way in Asia, which is an area we want to go to, the measure of American foreign policy is whether we're willing to follow through with what we said in Syria. If we're not willing to do that in Syria, they would conclude we're not going to do it with North Korea, we're not going to do it with China, we're not going to do it with anything that we say in Asia. So why should they trust our foreign policy? Uh, and I think w one thing that was lost uh, uh, on us in the first term of President Obama's uh, tenure in office is that we're living in a global world. You, you know, people in Asia don't only listen to what we say to them about Asia. They're also looking at what we say to the Middle East, and they're looking at, at, at our balance sheet in the Middle East as a measure of what it means for them. So engagement in the Middle East today, getting it right in the Middle East today, I think is the foundation stone of convincing Asia to follow America's lead over there. We're not going to be successful in Asia if upon arrival there are doubts because of the way we handle the Middle East. In an ironic way, we shouldn't pivot from the Middle East to Asia. We should use Middle East as a springboard to Asia. And that means you have to get it right in the Middle East in order to get it right in Asia. So we have another uh, analogy of springboard. Now, the, the subtitle of your book is American Foreign Policy in Retreat. Uh, is American foreign policy in retreat? What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, it was a big declaration, again, uh, both implicit and explicit of the administration, that we have big economic problems at home. We ought to focus at home. Uh, the president used the terminology of nation building at home. Uh, th this idea that foreign policy starts at home or, and, and that basically uh, we ought to focus at home was, again, maybe something that many Americans welcomed as a message. But I think outside of the United States, it was very well understood uh, uh, that this is a message of a tired uh, global superpower who doesn't want to do what it did before, and he wants to do less, and he wants to lead from behind, as the terminology became. And, and I think uh, uh, the sense was very clearly that we're retreating from that kind of American global leadership that had shaped the glo global economy, that had uh, led in uh, this deciding global security, that had led in places like Balkans, that had created all the kind of treaty organizations from WTO to um, you know, human rights and, and, and varieties of other uh, climate and varieties of other global treaties, that the United States basically was saying, we don't want to be leaders anymore. We want to be one of the pack. And maybe sometimes we welcome actually others doing things, and then we would support them. So this is retreat from you know, where we were under Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush. I mean, people may have criticized our policies, but they took it for granted that the United States has a stabilizing role in the world, has a leadership role to play, that without the United States, the world would be a very different place. And they very well understood that this rhetoric of focusing at home and letting things go internationally and let others take care of it was a retreat from where we were. And well, we have to call a spade a spade. Well, Madeleine Albright has said that uh, foreign policy is getting other countries to do what we want them to do. Uh, have we given up on that? Are we no longer interested in getting other countries to do what we want them to do? Well, you can't get other countries to do what you want them to do without being persuasive with them. And you can't be persuasive with them if your initial statement is that we're not going to show up or we're not committed or we don't really want to lead here. That's not going to persuade people to do things. If people decide you're not going to be a player uh, in this region or on this issue, they begin to factor you out. They begin to look after their own interests. So if countries in the Middle East decide that the United States is not engaged, wants to put its resources in Asia, is not going to be a player if there is a civil war in Syria, if there is a humanitarian crisis, if there is a coup in Egypt, whatever it is, they begin to say, well, you know, we live in this neighborhood. We're going to look after our own interests, and we're going to make decisions on our own. And then you begin to lose control over that. 
So, but to, to assert control, uh, it must necessarily include a willingness to use our military, isn't that right? Well, that's always lurking on the background. But, but the military uh, option is on the table, but we ha that just can't be uh, a, uh, a paper threat. We actually have to be prepared to use our military if necessary, isn't that we right? We always have to, and, we, and when we, we've used this threat very well, and I think everybody understands that. But, but the problem... Speak softly and carry a big stick, said uh, Teddy That's Roosevelt. absolutely right, but I think people are taking that less and less seriously. Because if you listen to, their, again, the rhetoric of the past five years, the administration has been saying repeatedly, we can't afford a war. We're economically too broke to do that. When the discussion of Syria came up, it was said very, very explicitly that the United States uh, would not like to use even a minimal amount of use of threat, uh, force in Syria because it would be a slippery slope to a much larger war. So we reduced foreign policy in our own domestic discussion to being either military invasion and occupations of countries or doing nothing. And that's not a good place to be because then nobody outside is going to take your use of uh, force, the threat of use of force seriously. When you make it as such a gargantuan zero-sum choice, they're going to say, look, if that's the choice, the United States is just going to be completely disengaged. So we have plenty of room to operate, or we have to look after our own interests. Uh, and I think the danger of that approach is that problems don't go away. They fester and they get bigger. And ultimately, you may have to actually do the kind of military intervention you never hoped to do uh, because you let problems get out of control and became too big. So where is the place you'd like to see us be? I know you're a champion of the concept of soft power, a term uh, coined by your colleague Joe Nye at uh, the Kennedy School. Uh, but uh, what is uh, uh, soft power if uh, there's no willingness uh, to use hard power? Well, I think right now the challenge is that we have to be firm power. We have to be a trusted power, and we have to show that there is certain stability to our presence and policy, that we don't dash in, uh, as we did under the Bush period, into Iraq and try to occupy countries and forcibly change the direction of history. But we also don't, you know, suddenly leave completely and create a vacuum either. Countries have to believe that when the United States asserts a policy and, 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 and articulates its interests, that that's going to be abiding. And there's certain constancy and stability to that. I mean, if you're a country in Asia right now and you see China being assertive over territorial claims, you want to know if the United States puts its foot down and says that it's not going to tolerate unilateral change of boundaries in the region, that it means that, that that's not something that's going to change next year. And I think right now the challenge is not whether we're using soft or hard power. The challenge is the, 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 that people have stopped believing that we, we have any kind of a consistent policy. That we're interested in using any power. Or we're not interested in using any power. And once they do that, then they begin factoring you out. So then countries in the region were going to say, okay, the United States may say this today, but they may not follow through tomorrow. So what is our own policy of dealing with this long run? Or the United States for two decades said the, the Middle East is the most important place in the world. Then one morning they woke up and said, no, we don't think so. We're going to go to Asia. What's going to prevent the United States doing the same thing a decade from now in our own region? And if people don't trust in, in your leadership, they're not going to follow you. And, and I, we're going to find this in the coming years, the next decade, to be our biggest challenge is going to be how to restore uh, trust in uh, the permanence of American leadership and trust in what we say w we would like to do. So your argument essentially is that our interest in the Middle East exceeds our influence because we've backed off. Well, we still have major interest in the Middle East. And the fact that we're in denial that we have that is also baffling to many countries around the world. Uh, we think we're energy independent. We have been energy independent from the Middle East for a long time. But if Middle East gets into crisis and oil markets, the oil markets are going to react to that. We're going to then import the, uh, the, the oil price into this country. We, we're not importing oil from the Middle East. We're importing oil prices. So, you know, countries around the world 
don't buy this energy independence uh, so argument. So talk about fracking and hydrocarbons and energy independence right. really uh, is not significant in your view. Well, it is significant, but it's not in the way we think that Middle East doesn't matter at all. So, uh, you know, what happens if Saudi Arabia is not pumping oil? Where is China going to buy its oil? They're going to show up at the countries that we're buying oil from, or they're going to show up in the United States buying from our suppliers. Prices are going to go up. We went to the Middle East into a war in order to prevent terrorism. Look around. Al-Qaeda is back. It's back in Libya. It's back in Egypt. It's back in Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, Iraq. Can we really, in all honesty, say that we don't have a vital security interest in the Middle East? Um, we can't. So, so, you know, even this argument that the Middle East doesn't matter, doesn't matter to global security, the global economy, is not, uh, is not a credible position. So uh, let's uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, you served two years in the mm -hmm. Obama administration. You were an advisor to Hillary Clinton in the State Department and also to Richard Holbrook. Uh, and I guess uh, uh, substantially you worked on Afghanistan, Pakistan matters. Isn't that right? That's right. Now, now you emerged from that experience disillusioned with the uh, the Obama administration and uh, how it formed policy. Perhaps you could tell us about that. Well, you know, I detail that uh, in the book, but I think the, the large part of it was that uh, uh, I, uh, I think the way we decided to surge into Afghanistan and then immediately to declare that we were going to uh, uh, wind down and then by 2014 we were going to leave, uh, ultimately, I thought was driven by uh, domestic political calculations, but not with a view to our regional strategic interest. And it was a policy that no one in the region, you know, thought was a credible policy. And uh, very quickly, they began to write us off as, uh, be, as having any role in the future uh, of Afghanistan. We saw, as a result, the president of Afghanistan begin to uh, balk at cooperation with the United States, countries around Afghanistan began to think about what might be uh, the, uh, their own uh, designs for the future of Afghanistan. I think a, a, a credible path would have been to use our heart, the threat of our heart power, to get the region and the fighting sides in Afghanistan into a political settlement that would uh, at, at least create a, a structure for uh, uh, continuation of uh, uh, governance in Afghanistan, bring ceasefire to the country, and have the support of the region. We have ended up leaving Afghanistan without having won the war. We have not defeated the Taliban. They're there. Their power is intact. They're still poised to take over the country. We have not cowed the neighbors of Afghanistan into any kind of a cooperation with our plan. And we haven't put in place a peace deal either. So we're leaving Afghanistan not having won the war and not having achieved the peace deal. And basically, we're abandoning uh, uh, the fight. Uh, and, and that, I think, will uh, damage uh, not only uh, our credibility in, in the Middle East and beyond, but also means that the very reasons why when we went to Afghanistan in the first place could very well return to that country. And this longest war since Vietnam could end up, in the end, be uh, having been fought for nothing. Well, now it appears we'll have some military presence there until 2022, uh, but still with no resolution in sight. Well, that military presence is really to protect America's special forces and drones in order to uh, be able to carry counterterrorism operations in northern, uh, northwestern Pakistan and southern Afghanistan. This is not a force that's going to have any impact on the insurgency or on the fighting. It's a force to protect the force. So uh, you're critical of what the administration did, but uh, what do you think we should have done? We should have uh, pressed harder diplomatically for a political solution? Well, when we, you had the threat of force and when you had the force on the ground, was the time to basically uh, argue with the warring parties that the price of United States withdrawal is a peace deal. When you tell the Taliban we're, we're leaving anyways, and we think we achieved victory. We're going to just declare victory and leave. They celebrate. Well, they said, let's just wait for them to go and maybe expedite their departure. We'll resume as soon as, as, soon as they're gone. There is, there's no incentive on the part of Taliban or the backers in Pakistan to arrive at a credible political deal because the, the main reason they would have engaged us in a political deal was to 
get the United States to leave. If the United States is going to leave on its own, they don't have an incentive to negotiate. And to top it off, we never were even serious about negotiations. And, and, and ultimately, what they saw was that we, we surged into Afghanistan in order to satisfy one segment of American public opinion. And then we quickly said, we're done. This was good enough. We're going to withdraw. And that was to satisfy a different segment of, of, Amer of American public opinion. But writ large, what they saw was that the president wanted to leave Afghanistan. And he did not want to win the war. And he did not want to really engage in a political So He didn't want diplomacy either. But are you confident that uh, had uh, the president adopted your position and Holbrooke's position and pressed hard for a political solution, that given uh, Karzai, his uh, corruption, uh, the drug trade, the involvement with the drug trade, uh, and uh, his lack of uh, cooperativeness with the United States, uh, that uh, we could have achieved it? Do we really have a dog in the fight? Do we really have a partner there to achieve a political solution? Well, Karzai is only one of the actors there. Uh, the Taliban, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, India, they, they're also very big stakeholders. And, you know, it's not the first time that we would have uh, arrived at a deal with people that are unsavory characters. I mean, you look at the deal at the Dayton Agreement that ended the war in former Yugoslavia that Richard Holbrooke negotiated, and you look at somebody like Milosevic, he was corrupt, he was uncooperative, he was a butcher, he had a, a vicious human rights record. But ultimately, a deal is a lot bigger than, uh, than Karzai. This would have been about bringing peace to the whole region, taking away the reason why Afghanistan is, is so unstable. Uh, uh, we did this in 2001 in the Bonn Agreement, uh, where we actually gave Afghanistan a constitution. All the neighbors, uh, uh, with the exception of Pakistan then, agreed to a, a political framework for Afghanistan that they all would agree to. Um, that is absent here. There is no consensus between us, Pakistan, Iran, India, Russia, and the future of Afghanistan, the political future of Afghanistan. There's no peace deal between the warring factions. There's not even a ceasefire deal between the, uh, the warring factions. There's actually no, nothing political there. Now, you know, diplomacy is hard, uh, but diplomacy is the alternative to war. And uh, if you say that, you know, you don't want to fight, in a prolonged way, and you're not committed to winning the war and defeating the Taliban completely, and, and you say also the alternative is not uh, serious diplomacy, the only thing people looking at this argument can, can conclude is that you're just going to leave it. Just leave it. Now, we're drawing to a close, and uh, I wanted to just switch the subject for a moment. Uh, your origins, of course, are Iranian, mm -hmm. and we've just uh, concluded some kind of an interim mm -hmm. deal with Iran. Uh, do you like the deal? Where do you think we're headed? How do you think it's going to play out? Well, I, I, I think it's the first time that Iran has signed on to any kind of a deal that, that limits its nuclear uh, program. The deal that was on the table in 2003, and there was a potential uh, opening in 2005, would have got us to a better deal than we have today. So one lesson is waiting longer has not produced a better deal. So Iran had 1,800 centrifuges in 2003. It has about 20,000 today. So 10 years of sanctions and not negotiating has bought us 18,000 additional uh, uh, centrifuges. Now, the argument would be if we don't cut a deal now, you know, they're going to continue to uh, build more centrifuges. And we've already declared very loud and clear we're not going to go to war with Iran. I mean, I think if you listen to everything that the president has said about Syria and the Middle East, and you're sitting in Tehran, your conclusion is that the military option is not on the table. So I think it's good that, you know, economic pressure... Except Israel may attack them. Well, I don't think the Iranians are, are as phased by, by that threat or take it as seriously as the argument of a United States uh, a, a attack on Iran. But end of the day, day, I think the Iranians concluded that economic pressure uh, uh, is, is reason enough for them to come back to the table, combined with the fact that I think they understand, as the president has said recently, that the United States and the international community will agree to certain amount of enrichment, which means that the U.S. has moved away from zero enrichment. And the focus will be on Iran not having weapons as opposed to not having enrichment. Well, even the Israelis have said uh, that uh, the 
more comfortable with the deal if uh, even with the right to enrich uh, if uh, Iran will stop threatening them that's all there and, and and it's not a given that the deal will will have legs and will go past six months I mean there are many reasons why it might break apart there are uh, uh, very hardline uh, uh, opponents to a deal in both countries in both Iran and the United States and 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 they may very well scuttle this deal so are you optimistic I'm optimistic because uh, uh, even this deal was unthinkable a year ago. Unthinkable a year ago. Well, I have a question for you, right. Valley Nasser. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, uh, has the Obama administration made uh, the Middle East the dispensable region? But yes, I think the Obama administration started thinking about the Middle East as a dispensable re uh, region, but the Middle East decided that it, 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 it will not be dispensable. The Middle East refuses to be ignored. And the more we have tried to brush it aside as unimportant, the more it has produced events, opportunities, and more so crises that have forced the administration to keep postponing its pivot and, and having to be focused on the region. So today we look, the, the lion's share of attention on foreign policy and the lion's share of our Secretary of State's time is spent on Middle East issues. So our takeaway is pivot, postpone, Valley Nasser, thank you so much for coming by. This has thank been you. just marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. For Conversations in the Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Good night and all the best.